All right, good evening. How is everybody? Yeah, thank you for coming. I'm excited to see so many folks here. Um, so, welcome to the fourth event in the Diverse Roots at the Common Table Lecture Series, a series focused on culinary conversations in the American South. My name is Erica Abrams Locklear. I'm a professor in the English department here at UNC Asheville. And I've got a few things, I'll try to make it quick, um, to share with you before I introduce tonight's speakers. First, if you'd like to attend more lectures like this one, keep an eye out for announcements about future speakers. This series runs through the spring semester of 2025, and we are planning to have a speaker or panel of speakers each semester. This fall, for example, we'll focus on indigenous foodways in the South. Historian Melinda Maynor Lowry and cultural anthropologist Courtney Lewis will be in conversation about the important role that Lumbee and Cherokee food traditions play in Southern cuisine. The event is at 6 p.m. on Wednesday, October 16th. We're planners, so mark your calendars. <laughs> Second, Tonight's roundtable conversation will last about an hour, followed by approximately 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. We have a microphone mounted on a stand, and where is our Q&A microphone? Right here. Everyone's pointing to it. This is where you go to ask your questions. Um, we're live streaming the event, and we get much better sound if the mic is stationary, so we don't have a runner to run it throughout the audience. Please refrain from making comments or observations. We want to hear as many questions as possible. And to facilitate a pleasurable reading and Q&A, please silence your cell phones and any electronic devices that you've got that might make noise. Once we conclude discussion, please remain in your seats until our speakers have had time to get situated at the Malaprops table located near the entrance to this room. Many people have worked hard to make this event a success and I'd like to thank them briefly now. First, a big, big thank you to our event partner, Malaprop's Bookstore and Cafe. Everybody clap. <laughs> Asheville's own local independent bookstore. They have advertised this event widely, and they are here tonight selling books. Thank you, Stephanie jones Beern, Justin Souther, Patricia Furnish, who is back there at the table, wave Patricia, and the rest of the Malaprops crew. So one note, they weren't able to transport all of the books here from our amazing authors that you might want to buy, but Patricia wants me to let you know that you can place orders tonight and she will have them ready for you tomorrow at the store. So the store is brimming over, um, so feel free to place an order. Big thanks go to Asheville Citizen Times reporter Tiana Cannell, Gina Malone, editor at the Laurel of Asheville Magazine, food writers Kay West, Andy Hall, Tennille Tracy, and Gina Smith. The marketing and communications department here at UNC Asheville also de deserve a big thanks for their help with event promotion. Funding for this event is made possible thanks to the Thomas Howerton Distinguished Professor of the Humanities Professorship. Thank you as well to our tech team, Chris Asbel, Kevin Fuller, Kent Thompson, and Scott Sabo, who are making all of these things work. <laughs> and finally, my biggest thanks go to Marcy Cohen Ferris, Sandra Gutierrez, and Ronnie Lundy. <laughs> all of whom said yes when I invited them to be part of this series. I was a little bit blown away that I was able to get all three of you on a stage together at the same time. We like one another. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so if you're here, then you already know that you're in for a treat. These women are giants of the food world. So let me tell you just a little about each of them. For over 40 years, Marcy Cohen Ferris has studied, documented, interpreted, exhibited, taught, and written about the South, largely through its foodways, material culture, and the Southern Jewish experience. As a professor emeritus in the Department of American Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Ferris is an editor for Southern Cultures, a quarterly journal of the history and cultures of the U.S. South, 
and a senior leadership advisor to the Center for the Study of the American South. She is the author of Edible North Carolina, The Edible South, Matzo Ball Gumbo, and she is a co-editor of Jewish Roots in Southern Soil. And just so you know, Edible North Carolina is the impetus for tonight's roundtable. Next, Ronnie Lundy is hands down one of the most well-known, if not the most well-known, experts on Appalachian food in America. There's only two of us. <laughs> Her 2016 Appalachian cookbook, Vittles, won the James Beard Book of the Year Award and the Award for Best in American Cooking. She is the author of a number of other cookbooks, including Shuck Beans, Stack Cakes, and Honest Fried Chicken, Butter Beans to Blackberries, In Praise of Tomatoes, Sorghum Saver, and more. Her edited collection, Cornbread Nation 3, Foods of the Mountain South, is required reading for anyone interested in food, literature, and representation. Ronnie was a founding member of the Southern Foodways Alliance and the Appalachian Food Summit. Marcy was also deeply involved in those organizations, the Southern Foodways Alliance, as is Sandra. In 2009, she received the Southern Foodways Alliance Craig Claiborne Lifetime Achievement Award, and currently she runs Plot Hound Books in Burnsville, North Carolina. So if you live here, you should really take a trip up to Burnsville and visit the bookstore. And finally, Sandra Gutierrez is a journalist, author, food historian, and professional cooking instructor. She has written five cookbooks and is considered one of the top national experts on Latin American foodways and Southern American cuisine. She has over 3,000 original recipes and over 1,500 articles published worldwide. In 2017, Gutierrez was awarded the MFK Fisher Grand Prize Award for Excellence in Food Writing. In 2019, her work in culinary objects became part of a permanent food exhibit at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. She is the author of The New Southern Latino Table, Latin American Street Food, and more. Her newest book, Latinissimo, Home Recipes from the 21 Countries of Latin America, features approximately 500 recipes, a number she spent four years whittling down from about 9,000 recipes. I look forward to hearing more about this encyclopedic accomplishment. We are extremely fortunate to have these women here with us tonight, so without further delay, please join me in welcoming them to UNC Asheville. Okay. So my first question, and I'm going to have a small role in all of this so you know, um, is for Marcy. So as you know, this lecture series highlights diverse food traditions in the South. And you actually kicked off the lecture series with your wonderful um, lecture called Edible Jewish South. You were part of the Farm to Table event, and it was extraordinary. And your latest book, Edible North Carolina, continues to highlight these diverse food ways and is the impetus for tonight's discussion. And two of the essayists included in that book are sitting on this stage, right. Ronnie Lundy, Sandra Gutierrez. So can you tell us a little bit about how you came to put that book together, how you decided who to include, where you found those people, what the process was like? Okay, just remind me what all those are questions because I... I just forget. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when I stop, I add some more. But I, I've got to add, besides, I just want to tell you quickly, well, thank you for having me as part of this wonderful group. And to be with y'all tonight, it's really an honor. The western part of North Carolina, mountain, the, the mountains are a really critical site to this book. Um, I turned to Elizabeth Sims, who's right there, and to Ronnie Lundy to really help me think about how to go about, inter I, I did a lot of interviewing before we, we got going with the book, just did a big old, you know, field trip around the state. I just did a lot of driving. You might have seen the image that said, always cut your bagel in half before you go, you know, down the mountain. It's just a good idea. <laughs> if you're eating it and you're driving by yourself, it, it, it's dangerous, you know. So, but, so I just want to list also who's, who's here that's also involved in this book. I'm the editor of Edible North Carolina, along with my associate editor, who is a former uh, doctoral student of mine, Casey Highsmith, who lives in Carborough, North Carolina. She's a fantastic young scholar doing 
wonderful work. You should Google her and follow her, her food work. And we found wonderful people that I'll tell you a little bit more about that process. But also included in, in the book, um, Kia Mastriani has an, an essay <laughs> and, and where she talks very much about the forever farm that she created with her partner and husband, Jamie Swafford. And that's a beautiful essay, and that's entitled To Be Rather Than To Seem, Creating a Food Life in the Foothills. And that's really Kia's story, talking about how does a young couple today really go about finding land, creating a farm, creating a dream. They both came from very different worlds. What's that process like? We know it's got a lot of challenges. And Kia really shared those in a really, really beautifully powerful way, along with her recipe for strawberry pie. And so Ronnie's essay, I just want to say, is entitled Crafting Asheville's Foodtopia, Two Decades in the Mountain South. And that's where you really took a historical look back at this food landscape, of the vibrant food landscape that we all know in Asheville today. But Ronnie was like, how and why? And she went about doing that by profiling like four, four individuals, including Elizabeth Sims, who's here. And Sandra's essay, pulling up a chair at the New Southern Latino table in North Carolina. And you'll we'll talk a lot more about that phrase, pulling up a chair. Uh, your recipe was wonderful, wonderful um, cookies. Yeah pecan polverones with a coffee granita, which is just fabulous. And Ronnie's oh, right recipe now. was... Um, was John Fleer's. Yeah, the John Fleer's <laughs> rhubarb, the rhubarb's red wine sorghum vinaigrette, which is fantastic. And then, um, Erica, you mentioned Melinda Maynor Lowry is going to be speaking. She's got an essay here also. To be a lumbee is to cook, sing, and gather think about this. We just heard an incredible performance last night of Lumbee, of, Lum, of Lumbee singing at the Carolina Performing Arts Center, which was amazing last night. And her recipe, of course, is for the famous Lumbee colored sandwich, which we can talk a little bit more about. And then lastly, Courtney Lewis, who also, are they speaking mm -hmm. together? Um, Courtney Lewis's essay is entitled Native Food Sovereignty, a North Carolina case study, and her recipe is bean bread. And Courtney is an anthropologist who teaches at Duke, and Melinda Maynard Lowry was at Chapel Hill and is now at, at Emory. But, you know, I'll, quickly I'll tell you my husband Bill, who's a folklorist, is here, and he studies in the blues in Mississippi. And Bill had this phrase where he talked always about his doctoral work that he did on the blues in Mississippi, and he said it, it was like a blues family. Mm -hmm. And I thought that phrase was really, really powerful, and I always kind of thought, well, that's kind of like what the North Carolina food landscape is like, too. It's very much a food family. I mean, most, many of us know each other, but from very, very different fields, you know, from literally from fields to farms to universities to scholars to brewers to, you know, just, I mean, to extension folks to people, you know, in PR, in journalism, you know, we, we all are in these food-related fields, but we tend to know one another. And I was very interested, I was teaching, this is part of my food teaching that I was doing at the University of North Carolina, and I wanted to kind of zero in on how do we understand food systems in America today? Because, you know, there's a reason they're called, you know, SAD, you know, S-A-D, you know, they're, it's, just, it's just a sad food system in general. And um, we really wanted, I really wanted to dive in through the lens of one state. So we focused on North Carolina in a class, and then a book was supposed to come out of that. And then I, then I thought, well, maybe we should do the book. So, so this is the book, and turned to individuals that had to represent across the state, uh, gender diversity, race, uh, you know, um, 
of, you know, just every factor, you know, age, you know, uh, yeah, in, 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 that one. age <laughs> involved, you know, involved in different aspects. And, um, you know, just, and, and so that's, that's really how, how we chose. And so, and then it was, it was COVID, you know, and so there you go. So that, that's been, that was part of the journey too. But I also just want to mention that my team, besides Casey Highsmith, was a great photographer, Baxter Miller, and you're really seeing all of Baxter's work here and her partner, Ryan Stansel. They've done a lot of work for our state and uh, for many other publications. Thank you. Um, so two you know, of those essayists are, are right here, and, and one of the organizing principles of this round table is where we see these Latinx and Appalachian food traditions intersecting or not. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit and then, and then maybe pass it over to the folks on the table. Yeah, do you wanna start? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm gonna reiterate something that we talked about early this morning. Uh, in, in another group, and that is that um, when this conversation comes up, uh, we immediately start to think about the most recent migration of Latinx people into the region. Um, but um, when you're talking about Latinx foodways in Appalachia, um, we would not have our foodways if it were not for the people of South and Central America. The food that we eat, the primary, the primary food that we eat, the corn, the beans, and many of the squash, were developed largely by women in uh, South and Central America uh, who saw, you know, that, that person who saw a grass with one seed and not only figured out how to cultivate that and turn it into a corn cob, uh, but then by some fascinating alchemy, uh, realized that if you mix that corn with ashes or with shells from the certain areas of coastal areas, that you increase the nutritional value of that corn by tenfold, and it can become yeah, yeah. It, so it so so we're not talking just about a, a, a current phenomena, and we are not talking about people who do not already have a tremendous role and a tremendous claim on what we call Appalachian foodways. And that's just something I feel like it's really important for us to remember, just like it's important for us to remember, Sandra and I have been on a panel where I've done this before, that, that when the Europeans pulled up in their boats all the Native Americans were not standing on the shore waving a corn cob and saying, thank God Welcome you're here, home. what do we do with this, right? Yeah. We, we tend to acknowledge that our foods were developed by the people who were here. We don't tend to acknowledge that they understood what to do with them, often in ways that are better than the ways that, that we do. So I just encourage everybody to kind of adjust your uh, preconception about about what what the groundwork is here, what the level is here, and I think that the connection between Appalachia and and Latin America is one of similar ingredients, similar cooking techniques, and similar people at the base of our cultures. So, in terms of uh, ingredients, and I'm going to tell you some, and you're going to think that's southern. Tomatoes, potatoes, cacao or chocolate, pork. Those are all Latin American based things that came later up south from below, further south. Um, cooking techniques, barbecue, barbacoa, the term, was coined by the Taino Indians in the Dominican Republic, today the Dominican Republic. And it was a term. Um, that meant cooking food on a stick directly over the fire. And it was barbacoa, still used today in Latin America. They, the indigenous people of South America, took, the, took it further along. And when the Spaniards came to the Americas, they loved the fact that they could cook 
meats directly in the fire, but it wasn't pork, it wasn't beef, it wasn't chicken, because those weren't here before the colonial colonization of Latin America. They were eating duck and venison and turkey and iguanas and turtles and reptiles. Um, so it was different, but the technique was the same. It was the enslaved people of the Latin American countries, starting in Brazil, that are responsible for disseminating the technique and bringing it up to the South. So it, it, just, by getting, just by talking about ingredients, um, about techniques, and about culture, you can see all we have in common already. And you probably didn't think about that before you walked into this room. So this is going to put a completely different spin on anything that you hear today, because we all start from a place of commonality, not from a place of difference. Now, and also, I think what's so powerful about what you're both saying, I mean, it's like the, the power of the bread, the, of the food landscape and the origins of the food in this planet that come out of the global south, and also that the south, Appalachia included, are, is this place where, it's one of the places in the world where agriculture is domesticated. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, you know, the, the, yes. The, the, where it happens, what, what Ronnie was exactly describing, you know, that someone sees a grass and takes a bite of it and thinks, you know, I think we can do this, this is good, I'm, I'm going to try to grow more, we're going to domesticate this and take the wild land. And that only happens in a very few places in the world. And so the South is one of those. And it's especially like the lower Mississippi River Valley, I learned a little bit of this from our fabulous folks in archaeology at the University of North Carolina. Ben Stephanitis, who's a great archaeologist, talks about the food abundance that existed, especially like in the Mississippian period. And that's about when corn. If that's when that's why the Mississippi period happens, because corn is introduced. So corn makes its way up from Mesoamerica, you know, through the Southwest, across into our region. And then it provides, and that's the mound builders in the Mississippi area, you know, that and we we see the the evidence of those incredible mound, you know, communities. And you have to have enough people. And then you had to have enough food to sustain a population to build that kind of hierarchical society, you know, with priests and, you know, and, and that it took corn, you know, but there were also the negative sides of that, of drought and uh, disease, disease and pandemic, mm -hmm. you know, it's also, also cyclical, but this world is so deeply historically connected to that early, early history. And when we think about Pangea, you know, where this, why, why the, why this is such a, you know, biologically, you know, just such a rich area, but I, all those connections to Latin America are incredible. I'm thinking, I'm thinking about something that you were just saying, and I'm going to kind of move the conversation a little bit um, in the direction of, of Edible North Carolina um, and talk about um, one of the people who I didn't profile uh, in my essay, but who I introduce in the introduction to the essay, and that is John Stelling. Uh, John and his wife, Julie, uh, as many of you know, opened the Early Girl Cafe in early 2002, which was right about the time that I had moved to Asheville, and we became friends, and uh, John and I became uh, traveling buddies sometimes because he's a he's a great person to ride along with. Uh, he and Edward Lee are two of my favorite people to ride along in a car with because they never met a food stand they didn't want to stop at. Right? <laughs> um, but. Um, at that particular time when early girl opened there was there was starting to be this food movement here in the Asheville area and and it was a perfect storm of certain things there were there was first of all there was the program at Warren Wilson College which is extraordinary the farm program there and they were raising not not your romantic back to the landers uh, 
plant a little garden, try to find Jesus on our own, thank you, Mr. Prime, um, uh, kind of romantic uh, concept. They were, they were teaching kids to think about the economics of being a farm person. And one of the people I profiled, Jamie Ager, is a great example of that. When Jamie and his wife, Amy, graduated from Warren Wilson College, their senior project was a five-year budget for their farm that outlined where they were going to be selling their produce and how they were going to actually make the money to keep the farm going and alive, which any of you who have had hickory nutcap meats or seen them in the grocery know that they did very, very well. So that was happening. What was happening was there was this growing interest in the country and the farm to food movement. There were people showing up here who had money. There were a lot of people who were willing to work in the restaurant industry. God bless you all. Um, all these things are going on, but what I wondered made it unique in Appalachia. And in 2008 or nine, Elizabeth Sims, is that the 14th time we've said her name? All right. <laughs> Elizabeth Sims, uh, who was at the Biltmore, put together this extraordinary 11-day program on Appalachian food and foodways. And it brought in everybody. It brought in a 12-year-old Sean Brock, who was making, uh, you know, okay, maybe he was 18, but <laughs> he was making cornbread. Uh, it, it brought in um, musicians. Uh, Tim O'Brien was there talking about the foods that he grew up eating. Um, it, it, there was just a bunch of us hanging out and talking, sitting around, drinking late at night, hearing Roy Blunt tell stories. It was really fabulous. I was on a panel. Uh, I was on a panel that included John Stelling, and he said the thing that was key to why this food movement took such root here in Asheville and in Western North Carolina. John has a much more famous brother, um, Robert Stelling, who had the Hominy Grill in Charleston and was nominated for the Beard Awards, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think Robert was there too. Um, and, and John said that when he and Robert talked about farm to table, Robert was going to farmers and saying, I need you to grow this for me. Can you grow this lettuce? Will you grow this uh, shiitake mushroom or whatever was the thing of the moment at the time? Will you grow these things? John Stelling was getting in his beaten up station wagon and driving up and down the mountains, stopping, stopping when he saw a farmer in the field, stopping when he saw a food stand, stopping at a restaurant and saying, what is this? What are you growing? How do you cook it? What do you do with it? How is it made? And what he realized is that while the rest of the United States have been overtaken, the agricultural world and the rest of the United States have been overtaken by factory farms, vast fields of grain, uh, hog lots, chicken, you know, chicken complexes that went on for miles and miles. Because of our topography, and also I'd like to say because of our natural independent honoriness, um, that had not happened here. You just, you can't have a factory farm in the mountains of Appalachia because it, they, they won't allow it. You know, they simply will not allow it. They, you, you're farming on a slant. You have to, in fact, uh, in my family, people didn't even have one garden. You had a garden for the sun food, and you had a garden for the shady food, and, and they would be in different places. And your grandmother had a different garden than your grandfather because they didn't like the same bean or tomatoes, right? So their micro, this sort of micro farming movement had never left the Appalachian Mountains. So when this movement started to happen, Asheville was just the, the, the nexus and the hub of this. And, and then also because there were some extraordinary people here who saw the vision and who could relate it in the story. Sorry. Can I jump in for just a second? Yes. Yeah. 2008 was the year I came here to start this job. Mm -hmm. 
And I remember reading in the newspaper about this festival at the Biltmore House, and I was astonished. I thought, this, this is a thing. The Lord is excited about mountain food. That's really exciting and very different than my childhood. I grew up in Nashville. That was not something that happened as a kid at all. Um, and Sandra, you write a lot about the changing landscape of food in North Carolina, in the South, in Cary. Can you speak a bit to your experience with that? Because I think it's so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I write a lot about the, the New Southern Latino movement, which is what I call it. And it is particularly in North Carolina and in, in the New South, what makes it interesting is that it's not Mexican-centric. Mexico is one of the countries that um, imparts a huge influence on everywhere that you talk about Latin cuisine. But in California and in Arizona and in New Mexico and Texas, it is a Mexican-centric movement because all of those territories were, were once part of Mexico. But here, on this other side of the country, we're very far removed from all of the land, really massive, that is Latin America. And in the 1980s, we start seeing a huge movement of Latinos from every kind of um, economic background, every time of career background. So you have your migrant workers, you have your uh, doctors, and you have people from all over the economic strata. And you have people from all over Latin America descending in the area that we know as the South all at once. And so what happens when people who share the same ingredients, the same culinary techniques, and the same cultural roots in our food all meet at the same time in the same territory? And that's what we're seeing. We're, we, we saw the birth of a new branch, if you will, of Southern cuisine. Mm. I've always referred to Southern foodways as a large tree a tree whose roots are three cultures, Native Americans, depending which groups, wherever you, you descend upon. So here, the Native Americans, the Cherokees, etc., the Lumbees. But when you go down to South America, you're looking at the Incas. When you go to Mexico, you're looking at the Aztecs and a lot of other groups. Then you have the Europeans who colonized us. And we were all colonized by the same group of Western European countries. So uh, you have the Spaniards, the Portuguese, the Iberian people, and then you have the Brits. You, you also have French in different groups, but that they were minor compared to the other three um, cultures. And they are one of our roots, too. But the third one that very few people realize is also a commonality with Latin America is the African vein. The importance that the African people brought to the foodways of Latin America and the American South, without which our food would not exist. Um, and, and so those are at the root of the tree. So that's the, 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 the part that holds this tree full to the ground, the three cultures that build it. Then you have the trunk of the tree. And in the trunk of the tree, you find um, the chefs, the people who are the co home cooks, the people who were in the back kitchens, the people who were in the big homes cooking for the white folks, the people who were um, here in the Appalachians cooking, and the people who were in Latin America cooking in their own homes for their own families to survive. And then you have the branches, and the branches are um, the movements, the culinary movements that form southern food waste. So you have the Cajun branch, and the Creole branch, and the Appalachian branch, and you have the, um, let's think of another one, the, the coastal branch. Uh, and then what I discovered is that there was this little branch that was starting to, be, to, to exist in this tree that was the New Southern Latino branch. And at the beginning, there was a little bit of resistance when I started talking about this movement. It was like, no, this can't be happening. We're, we're Southerners, we're Americans. And I'm like, yeah, we're Americans too. Uh, but, and we're even <laughs> south, more south than you are. <laughs> we're Southerners too. Uh, but it's not that, that Latin Americans are trying to take over a cuisine. It's just that there's a new branch in this tree. And the bigger the tree and the more branches it has, the more equity and the more diversity it allows under its shadow. And that's what's happening to Southern Foodways all over the place. To come to Asheville, and I promise not to stay away this long, but with a 20 year difference between my two trips to Asheville, and to see all of the Latin American influence, 
Tell them. Tell them. Food. Like this morning. Tell our lunch. <laughs> but, but this morning, Ronnie says, let's get together for breakfast. And she brought guava and cream cheese empanadas, which are called pasteles, from Owl Bakery. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, couldn't get more Cuban than that. That is traditionally Cuban. It's a classic combination of flavors. And then for lunch, we went to La Rumba. La Rumba. And if you haven't been to La Rumba here in Nashville, it's fantastic because it is Mexican cuisine. But I have news for you. It's authentic Mexican food from the southern tip of Mexico, Veracruz. So it's different. You're not going to find fajitas. You're not going to find burritos. You're not going to find the things that chips and salsa. Um, oh, yes. Please tell that part. When Instead of chips and salsa, <laughs> they serve you what we call crazy corn or elotes locos, which are corn in a cob that has been boiled, uh, and then it's slathered in Duke's mayonnaise, because it's got to be Duke's, <laughs> because in Latin America, we like our mayonnaise without sugar added, and we used to make it at home, so that's why we like Duke's mayonnaise. That's another thing we have in common. Uh, and then they roll it in cotija cheese, and they top it with some kind of... Um, Chile. powdered chile, whether it's ancho or, or um, guajillo, depends what you have on hand. And that is in place of your chips and salsa. And I dare anyone to tell me it's not as good or better than chips and salsa. Oh, way better. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so I invite you to go there and just try the different experience of Latin American food through the Mexican window, because I think that one of the things that is happening in North Carolina is that not only are you getting the diversity of 21 countries coming together into the Southern Territory and bringing flavors and, and recipes into being where they, they collide, they really do collide with uh, Latin America. Just to give you an example, um, you go to Charleston and you go to have lunch and you have a she crab uh, soup and it's creamy and it's deliciously spicy and it's warm and it's got all these seafood in it. But if you go south and you go to Honduras or to Belize, not even to go that far away, you get um, soups called tapados, which are our chowders, which are creamy, but they're not creamy with cream or with a bechamel base like they are in the south here. They're creamy with coconut milk and they have the same seafood. But then they have floating coins of corn, you know, sliced corn, and they have plantains that are boiled in that chowder. And, and you start seeing that the, the similarities. And, and that's what I discovered when I wrote the New Southern Latino Table, that I could create a dish and sit a Southerner and a Latino with each other. And both people would say, hmm, this reminds me of something my grandmother used to do. But there's something that's different. And they are on the table, at the table, sharing a meal, they could find the commonalities and start a conversation from a point of trust and from a point of amicability rather than from a point of otherness. So that is what's happening in the South. It's happening big time here in Nashville. It's happening everywhere in the, in, in the Southern part of the United States, the Southern region, and it's super exciting to see, but it's happening organically. People are not aware that, it, that they're part of it. You're all part of it. If you've ever had a hush puppy that has jalapenos in it, you've been part of it. Or a barbecue sauce with chipotle peppers, you've been a part of it. Or you've had a tomato sandwich with chipotle mayonnaise, you've been a part of it. I mean, it's, there are all these things that you're probably eating and you don't even realize. Collard green empanadas, anything like that. And Sandra, are there the big... Um, Latin markets here too, like huge Latin markets, and like where's like you like see Kampar. It, but they have here too. You have um, not necessarily here, but I was talking to Elena, who's a professor here earlier today, and she told me that there's this big store La Unica okay. uh, near nearby. We have huge supermarket stores, the small Latin tiendas that pop all over the place. You will find a lot of the small mom and pop owned Latin tiendas in this area, and I encourage you to go in and see them because some are owned by Guatemalans, but the other might be owned by Argentinians, and the other one is owned by Mexicans. And everything that you will find in each store is completely different from the next, because that is the diversity that Latin America brings to a South that was strictly black and white. So um, Burnsville, where I live, is has a population of 1,800 people, and we have three small tiendas in Burnsville. So it's it. Um, I'm trying to remember. 
there's a whole thing about the rodeo. There's a, a Mexican rodeo that happens up here also. And it's, I'm going down a path I shouldn't, because I can't see my way. No, but, but anyway, there, uh, these are becoming, this is becoming a part of our cultural landscape as well, um, um, because people are living here now. One of the things that uh, Sandra and I were talking about earlier was the fact that my family was part of the Appalachian diaspora. Um, I was born in Corbin, Kentucky, and my parents moved to Louisville um, when I was a child so my father could work. And so my connection to uh, my roots was a matter of going up home. And that was the second time my parents had been involved in a diaspora. Um, uh, during World War II, uh, they went to Detroit so my father could work in the munitions industry there. And I, I think about what my family experienced, probably my most foundational Appalachian literary text, the one that, as somebody said, you can have one book and take it with you, it would be The Dollmaker by Harriet Arno, which is about uh, a woman and her family who become a part of the diaspora, leaving Kentucky and going to Detroit. And the, the, the shattering of sense of loss of culture and connection and people, and also extraordinary food. A, a big part of that book um, has to do with the woman, Gertie, trying to buy food from the greengrocer, who's Italian, uh, that has some sort of flavor compared to what she remembered from her home. And I think about this pretty frequently in my small town, which now has people who have had to leave their homes because of economic reasons as well. And, and wonder how do, we, how do we make this connection? How do, we, how, to, how do we counter that sense of being a stranger in a strange land? Um, and food becomes a piece of that, you know? I mean, just, just consider the fact that the fundamental food for our culture and the culture, um, most of the people uh, who moved to Burnsville are from Michoaca. And um, our fundamental foods are pinto beans and a bread made of corn, right? Um, we eat ours with a lot of onion. They eat theirs with chili, right? Then we taste the chili and we eat ours with chili too, right? So, so that connection is there in, in these ways that it, you don't have to look very deeply in order to see them and in order to make some sort of personal connection with that. You know, I just wanted to go back for a second to what Ronnie was talking about of the, you know, what really begins the food movement, the vibrant food movement. Another factor that Charlie Jackson helped me understand over here and across the state of North Carolina and Y'all probably know Kelly Jackson was the founder of ASAP, the Appalachian Sustainable Agricultural Project in the 1990s. And we were talking about the tobacco, the federal tobacco bio, right? And when every, you know, across the state, small farmers who, or big farmers who were growing tobacco, and then they have to grab, either they stay in it or they grab, they grab the system change. And a lot of people in this region, especially, and in Piedmont, where, where we live, made a decision to go to, to vegetables, you know, or to produce, or to, you know, to grow, to grow fruit, and, you know, or open up, maybe, you know, you go great, you might get a winery, you know, or you're going to do cider, but you're going to make some kind of a pivot at that moment, and there was money available to help you make that pivot, like through the Golden Leaf, mm -hmm. where the money from the tobacco buyout went to the Golden Leaf Foundation in our state, that money was available, the votes to try to help them through that those difficult economic times, but you know that's that's followed by the farm crisis of the 1980s, where a lot of larger farmer, you know, mid-sized farmers, just you know, everything is is devastated by lower prices, by you know more yield because of fertilizer and globalization and what's happening. GMOs, TMO, you know, it's, it's really devastates 
you know, it's another another piece that devastates the, you know, the standard American diet. And you know, we start to see that the that these these small farms and this, and they they're the best model in this part of the state of how 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 to try to make it. Y'all are probably one of the best models of how you're how you're making it, of how you're trying, you know, what you do, how you wake up every day and you try to figure out what do we do. And there's Chris, also from Utopian C, Pro C Project. And Chris is, is um, part of Maya Serdan's essay here. And his voice in saving seed, exploring, you know, new seed options and new crops and new plants and new, you know, it's it's this is so powerful in this region. So we're really grateful to your work too. I think that the the strength of, of food is that we are able to communicate at a very organic, natural, trusting level from the very start. Think of feeding somebody in your home. Somebody comes to your house, they're trusting that what you're going to give them, that they're going to eat and introduce into their body is not going to poison them to begin with, right? Just that is huge trust, right? Well, after, after you've gone through that bridge where you can trust each other, it becomes so much easier to be able to understand each other. And that is what we've done over the years also when we talk together is tell people, Go to a table, find a seat at the table, bring somebody else to sit with you and discover who they are and discover the likeness that you have and discover the differences and learn to listen to each other. I always say, don't throw food at each other, like eat together and, and talk with each other and, and learn that there are going to be differences, but always remembering that what brought you to the table in the first place was that similarity, was that place of commonality that you that, that introduces trust. I'd love to hear a little bit more about specific foods and recipe developments. To take these ideas and, and to talk a little bit about how they apply when you're creating recipes for your book or when you're including recipes in middles, for example. And I know you've written a lot about um, the huge change in food and ingredient accessibility. Yes. In Cary, for example. So could you kind of walk us through that transformation and, and maybe talk about how that's impacted recipe development? Sure, I'd love to. Cary, for those of you who don't know, stands for Containment Area for Relocated Yankees. <laughs> so my husband and I automatically did not belong the moment we moved there in the early 90s. And Kerry was very white and very upper scale, you know, scale economically. Um, and all of a sudden, Kerry is so diverse right now. You go to Kerry and you find the largest Korean store you can think of, Indian stores all over the place. Um, you find Vietnamese places, Middle Eastern stores uh, next to Trader Joe's. You know, you see, it, it's so diverse and it's so, com you know, not complicated, but it's, it's created like a quilt of cultures that stands out from many other areas in the United States um, that usually was reserved only for very big cities. Like New York, you would see this kind of uh, uh, conglomeration of different cultures. In terms of food, it has changed what we eat. It has changed what we shop for. You can now go to Food Lion and buy a big uh, brisket, a full brisket, that's not only the, the, the slim part. Or, and then you can buy an arrachera, which is the type of meat that you use to make fajitas in the same counter that you can buy um, sausages, you know, or breakfast sausage for the morning breakfast with cornbread or to make your, your sausage gravy for your biscuits. It's all together. It's all in the same place. That wasn't heard of when we moved to North Carolina. I remember. No one had heard of cilantro when we moved here in 1985. Mm. It's like, what's that? Some people recognized it as Chinese parsley. That's how far away we go. And I remember trekking to Wellspring, which is now a Whole Foods store in 9th Street in Durham, to buy a one pound bag in a paper bag of black beans because they only got like a 10 pound bag every month. And you could only buy it one pound at a time in little paper bags. And no one knew what to do with them. I try to plant them. I, I, I should have tried harder. 
because now I know how to do it. But uh, it didn't occur to me to, to continue. But really, it's that the ingredients weren't here. The only chiles that you could find were tinned, um, all the Paso green chiles. And my first tamales were made with grits, which is the same ingredient. It's mixed tamalized corn, um, but treated in a different way. And collard greens. And that reminded me of the chipilin tamales of Guatemala, which are completely different from tamales that you'll find in other countries. So, so nostalgia brought the need for us to, to find the intersection between foods so we could create foods that, that fed us, that fed our souls. But southerners around us were also picking up on that, and they were bringing in those ingredients and bringing on those flavors because it reminded them of something they had had before. So it wasn't scary. They didn't have to take a very far leap of faith to try it because, oh, that looks like something I, I've eaten before. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's, that's, I think, the same in all over the South, what's happening in Cary is we're becoming less afraid of the other. As, as, as much as this country is going through a lot of fear of the other right now, I think small communities are losing the fear of the other. They're being more accepting and open to trying new things through food. I think food is the first step. After that, you can discuss anything else. But food is the really easy way to get people to, to find uh, commonality. Everybody likes to eat, for the most part. If you don't like to eat, you're not my people. <laughs> but everybody likes to eat. And um, even if you don't like to cook, you like to eat. And, and everybody needs to eat. So those two things together uh, already bring something in common between us. I was thinking, can I say one thing to tie in with, with okay. Sandra real quick? The, what you were talking about, you know, this kind of a, of a, of a you know, really diverse um, food landscape, and it feels like it happens, you know, maybe in a distant urban place, but, you know, we, we know we see that here. Yeah. Like you're saying in Cary and Raleigh, and I was looking at Ken and thinking about Kia Mastriani is also an oral historian and for the Southern Food Waste Alliance did a major project of interviewing food entrepreneurs up and down the Central Avenue corridor in Charlotte. And, you know, if anybody spent time down in Charlotte doing that, it's, it tells you about also, again, the changing economics of the state. You know, that was an area that had a lot of, like, small businesses and strip malls. And it was definitely, like, a working-class region, and it was... Businesses that have gone out of it, like radio, you know, dead radio shacks and you know phone stores and all you know, and those you know the immigrants that had arrived from Ethiopia and from Africa and from Oman and from you know the Middle East and you know uh, were living in affordable housing and houses you know up near Central Avenue and could afford rent. Where those, you know, where those businesses had absolutely closed, and it's, you know, it looks about the same, but an incredibly vital, interesting, delicious world. Our friend Tom Hanchett, who's a historian for the, you know, the New South Museum, or, or was, and it just as incredible, knows that world by is a great tour guide of the deliciousness of that of that world. But you can also look at those interviews online through the Southern. Food waste lions. Mm -hmm. lions. And they're pretty great. I, when you're talking about recipe development and you're talking about ingredients, uh, my second book, or as I refer to it, the book that time forgot, because no one knows I wrote it or where it is or what happened to it. But it was called The Festive Table, and I was writing about different celebrations, uh, how people were changing celebrations to reflect the realities of new families and new belief systems. Um, and uh, I was doing a recipe uh, from a wonderful Iranian uh, chef, Anu Shariat, in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and it had pomegranate molasses in it. And I had the worst copy editor in the history of the universe, and that's really saying a lot <laughs> uh, for those of you who are writers. Um, um, I, I, she was just amazing what she could argue about and she wrote back this very lengthy note saying that she had been everywhere uh, within a uh, 12 block area 
of her apartment in New York City and could not find pomegranate molasses and that needed to come out of the book. And I wrote back and said, sorry, two blocks away from my house in Louisville, Kentucky, there's a grocery where I bought my pomegranate molasses. You need to get around more. <laughs> um, it just, I, it, we have, I mean, we have lived through a period of time. I, as I noted earlier today, I am the oldest person on this panel. And in my lifetime, um, I, I didn't eat an avocado. I didn't see an avocado until I was 22 years old, right? But in my lifetime, we have become a global foodscape. Uh, we are no longer limited um, by the economics of where we live. You can come to my Ingalls in Burnsville, North Carolina, and they have a really excellent section of Latino, of Asian, of um, uh, not, not Scandinavian, um, kosher uh, foods. I'm, there's You can find all of these ingredients and foods that you once could not. So it, in, in some ways, when we talk about these things, we're talking not about um, something that's happening, but something that's already happened. Exactly. You know, uh, um, we have we have become a global foodscape, and 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 I my family adored uh, hot sauce uh, long before it became a very cool thing. My family ate tamales. They came out of a jar, but they were tamales and they loved them. And it was just, it was very, very important um, to them. We, we are still trying to track down um, with um, Mike, Mike Costello, who is an Appalachian farmer, chef, and writer and communications person is uh, there's, there was a huge Spanish community that came into uh, West Virginia to work in the mines in the 1950s, right? And we're trying to track uh, how these foods became a part of the West Virginia foodways. Um, we have this, there's a food in Appalachia that is very near and dear to me called the chili bun. Not, not a chili dog. There's no dog in it. Okay. It's a chili bun. And the chili bun is very finely ground meat like you find in a taco that is spiced like meat you find in a taco. But instead of being in a taco shell, it is packed into a hot dog bun. And then you, you put mustard in there with it because it wasn't hot enough. My mother, okay, this was my mother's definition of the best chili bun if it made the sweat break out on the top of your lip, right? That's how, that's how spicy it was. And then you put onions, raw onions on top of that. And we know that it existed, that it primarily exists in the railroad towns that served coal country. So we, kn we know there's some sort of connection there. What we don't know is, could this be, could this be a Latino connection? Could this have been people working on the railroad or who had come into the mines who were making this food, which obviously has some sort of connection to Latino food waste, right? Um, or it's food born from strife and poverty and need, which is another thing that unites our cultures together. You know, absolutely. These are, these are simple foods that once you translate them to a different place because of the way that they're prepared, seem very exotic, but they really aren't. And at least they're, they're not exotic to the people who are making it and eating it every day. Um, you know, Sandra, Bill, in Bill Smith's essay, which is about, they are, I think the title is, you know, they are my brothers, they are my family. It's really about the incredible uh, community that he's had with the, with the chefs and the cooks that have worked with him. At Brooks Corner. Yes. And, and how they changed the menu in that how, house, southern Mecca. Right, right. And, you know, but he talks about one of the most important things they, that he valued about what they brought to Crooks was the, the power of utilitarian food. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the honesty, the deliciousness, and to value, you know, salsas and posole and, you know, and that, that's, that's, that's more than enough, you know. Posole, what we call hominy. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, one of the dishes from Bill Smith's restaurant, Crook's Corner, that totally 
shook my world. <laughs> Where his, his, it was his salad made with green peaches and lemon and chili. Yeah. Mm. Because that's how Latin Americans, that's how we eat mangoes, that's how we eat oranges. We eat with salt and chili, everything salt and chili. And his, between his crew and Bill, they came to create what is a new Southern Latino dish, which is it, it's made with a very quintessential Southern ingredient, which is peaches. And it just translated beautifully. It, it was, I was very emotional when I first tried it because it brought tears to my eyes. Because I recognized the flavor, I just, it, it was something that I grew up with. And, and like that, I think food is something that can also bring a lot of emotions to us. And if we're open, and we're willing to listen to the voices that are talking to us when we're tasting new things, it can be a very beautiful journey. Um, a very beautiful journey. We're touching on another piece here of the Latinization of Southern food and Appalachian food um, that that needs to be talked about. Um, do, does anybody besides me remember Ruben Blades, uh, the incredible? Oh God. Well, anyway, one of his albums is live in a club in New York, and he's singing in Spanish, and he stops and says, by the way, if you don't understand the words, ask your waiter. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and what, uh, what Bill's story brings to the fore, the fact that I would guess that 90% of the people who are preparing your food in the back of a restaurant of any kind these days, including uh, the Chinese restaurant that is in Burnsville, some of the people in there are Latino as well as being Chinese immigrants, right? Or, no, Asian immigrants. I'm sure they're not even Chinese at, the, at this point, but Asian immigrants coming here. Um, your food is being made by people who are here from South America, Central America, and Mexico. Yeah, yeah, and and that's important to remember. The hands and the spirit and the heart that make your food affects how how you feel after you eat it. Which leads me to say, I'm feeling great because we ate at this place called La Rumba, yeah. and I cannot say enough times that you need to get the over there. It is fantastic food. <laughs> you know? well, I'm, I'm aware too that we're we're coming up on time here. Did you did you have some sort of closing um, thoughts or comments before we take questions from the audience? I think my ad was my closing. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about you know that certainly. Politics is all part about uh, is all woven into this, and how how we manage to all live here in this America today, and um, you know in these very fraught times. And I think Bill Smith in Chapel Hill is a really good example of you know the Latinx community that has supported him so strongly in the restaurant, and you know and it's really been his family. He's gone to Mexico and beyond every every year to be with the families of people that work for him. And he has more God children, children than anybody God. I know. <laughs> and, and the way those God children has been to make sure that every single child that he knows um, who are the children of, of the folks that have worked for him have passports. Mm -hmm. American and passports. Have American passports because things were getting, not even things were, things are, so dangerous that it's really important that if a parent was suddenly removed, um, you know, had, you know, arrested, that there was a plan for children. And so this is, I mean, I, I know everyone here is absolutely aware of, of, you, of, of what all the whole scene involves for us today is, is you know, incredibly powerful. You know, other than politics, food touches really on so many facets of our lives. Um, and the one thing that we forget is our humanity. And, and, and Ronnie and I were talking about this right before we started the program, that one of the bad things that social media and technology has brought to us in the last 20 years is that we have become more disconnected from each other. And we need to find that connection with one another again. And there is no better place to do it than on, around the table. And put your phones away and talk to each other and, and eat together and share and, and, and taste. Um, and, and let's bring back our humanity, our empathy for one another. 
we have forgotten to be empathetic for each other. Uh, we, we are so divided that we have forgotten that in finding something in common, we can build a stronger, better world. So my, my, my last word is eat a lot, but eat with soul. Eat with soul, because that's what Southern food is, after all. Thank you. So we've got a little bit of time for questions. Um, so just a reminder, please come up and use the microphone so we can hear you and people online can hear you. Um, so my question, um, I'm Cajun culturally, but I've recently become vegetarian and I'm trying to find new ways to like bring into my culture. Um, I haven't really found anything just because like Cajun food is so meat based and I was wondering if there has been like, sorry, do I need to get closer? <laughs> I was wondering if there has been like anything within like Southern culture or Latin culture with like the new movement of people doing new like dietary restrictions and moving into like being more plant based. I take it. Mm -hmm. In Latin American foodways, you will find a lot of vegan, vegetarian food, a lot of gluten-free food. It's just the way we eat now, normally. So meat is very much treated, unless you're in the epicenter of the, the meat center of Latin America, which is Argentina, Uruguay, um, in South America. You will find that meat is used like the Asians use meat, which is almost like the element of um, condiment more than the main. So I would say if you want to learn more recipes and use more recipes, try to find Latin American food ways, but also uh, remember your mushrooms. Mushrooms, you can substitute meat and use mushrooms a lot in the same recipes without changing the flavor profile. So if you like your gumbo, you can make it with mushrooms instead of you know using your, your sausage. And, and now you can find great vegan sausages and things like that. But uh, don't be afraid to go around the world in finding the uh, new flavors for the way that you eat. That the beautiful thing about inclusivity in food ways is that we are inclusive of every single dietary restriction and every um, way of eating. I, um, it's interesting because here's another place where our Venn diagram of our food ways that we grew up with intersects because uh, in my family, um, meat was also an aside. Uh, we ate largely vegetables, we ate uh, legumes and cornbread. Um, so we were actually getting that. I don't know if you've ever read Diet for a Small Planet, but I encourage everyone to. And that concept of mixing a protein with a grain in order to increase the nutritional value and the protein load of, of both of them. Um, a, a difficulty a difficulty that we have is that we have moved very quickly in in I don't know in terms of something we have moved very quickly from a society in which people needed a 3,000 to 5,000 calorie load a day in order just to produce the food that they could eat to stay alive uh, into a world in which 2,000 calories a day is an overload for many people. And uh, we don't have to work that hard to get it, uh, and we can very easily overtop it. So, so we do live with a number of health-related illnesses um, because we have not adapted uh, what we are doing. But one of the things that I found, I, you know, uh, when I was growing, I came of age during the counterculture and um, and uh, health food Nazis were everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And and the judgments that were made about the foods that I grew up eating were just so negative. Uh, but but in truth, they were not that bad. You know, one of the things I used to hear all the time is Southerners cook green beans until they're dead. No, Southerners cook green beans until you can access the protein that's in the bean, which was the point of it in the first place. Okay, a green bean was not supposed to taste like grass or look like grass. It was supposed to be a bean, hence the bean of the green bean. And in order to access the nutritional value of the bean, it actually has to be cooked to a digestible level. 
lycopene, I don't know if you all remember the big lycopene tomato mm -hmm. craze that happened and you would find high <laughs> lycopene tomatoes on your little vines in your grocery store and you were paying five times the amount that you did for another tomato and you were getting no lycopene from it because in order to access lycopene, to the tomato has to be cooked. So you would have done better if you had needed lycopene to grab a squirt bottle of ketchup and do it in, and rather than eat one of those tomatoes. I mean, there's a reason that ancient foods, our traditional foods, are cooked in the way that they're cooked, prepared in the way that they're prepared, consumed in the ways that they were consumed, and we need to pay attention to that and understand it. And then we can modify it. So I um, was written, written, bitten, oh God, bitten and written, huh? Uh, I was bitten by um, a Lone Star Tick uh, a couple of years ago and developed what is called, to my family's amusement, alpha gal syndrome. And, <laughs> and uh, this particular syndrome means that I can no longer eat red meat. Um, side note, I often have to tell young people that yes, pork is a red meat, it is not another white meat, right? But so I can't eat a lot of, you know, I can't cook my soup beans the way that I cook soup beans before. Um, in this global world we live in, there's a thing called Spanish smoked paprika. You put Spanish smoked paprika in anything and it's eau de bacon immediately, you know? <laughs> Add a little olive oil, you've got, you've got that wonderful texture and it's delicious. You just have to sort of Think and, and be creative. Consider it being your really good creative challenge. Yeah. Also, because what, what you know, you know the flavor profile, so that's all you need to know. You know, I guess you're from Louisiana, but that's, you know, that's what that's what you know. You know, you, and so it just, you use that, you don't need the meat. You know, you're just going to replace it with vegetables and grains and beans and, you know. It, it doesn't have to be tofu. Yes, <laughs> not at all. And also, I was thinking, my dear friend Louise Glickman is here, is from New Orleans, and it made me think about Mildred Covert. Do you remember Miss Mildred? So I did, I've done a lot of work on the Jewish South, and there was this wonderful woman in New Orleans, and her husband was was observant and kept kosher, and, and she did not grow up in, she grew up Jewish, of course, in New Orleans, but did not keep kosher, for sure, but then had to adapt, you know, for her husband. So she ended up, you know, kind of making, kosherizing, you know, all these kind of classic New Orleans and Louisiana dishes, and then went on to publish these books that are called like Kosher Cajun and Kosher Creole, and, you know, but they're, they're great, you know, so you, you can always, always, you, you, you have everything you need, you know, you know what it should taste like. Work on your recipes and you someday can be an impoverished cookbook writer like the like three you see on the side. You're just going to be way healthier than you're going to be for Which is a perfect segue to close and head to the mellow box table. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, our so, second favorite table, the table of books. Right. That's right. So if you would give our speakers just a minute to <laughs> Thank you all. Thank, you, Thank you all so much for coming and for being so attentive. I only saw three people go to sleep. It was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.